Okay, I'm very much just going to give you um, an overview of this project. And I'm not going to speak very much about the individual stones because they're just through those doors there. And hopefully um, at lunchtime we'll be flinging those open and you can go and have a look at the stones for yourself. Okay, how it all began. Um, it began in 2008 when I received an email from Mark Strachan from the North Ayrshire Museum Service. He was researching the Ardrossan coffin lid for redisplay. The stone had been discovered in 1910, and a Dr. Ross of the Royal Commission was amongst the experts called out to have a look at it. Dr. Ross is quoted in the Ardrossan and Salzkopf Herald in 1911, saying, the carved lid, so far as I know, is one of the finest of its kind in Scotland and is a specimen of medieval art at its purest, and the only one in Scotland, so far as I remember, that approaches it in beauty and design and execution is now in Dedup Castle Museum, Dundee. Well, that didn't ring any bells with me. <laughs> I had a look through all the databases. I couldn't find anything that matched a description. And I told Mark, surely I'd know if we had anything in our collections that was as important as all that. Uh, Famous last words, hey. It was too late for the redevelopment. Um, we'd chosen all our objects for the redevelopment of the museum. Um, but lo and behold, going through one of our out stores and under the very brief description of carved stones, we found tightly packed onto the shelves um, the stones that he was speaking about. Um, we couldn't really even take proper photographs of them. They were so um, closely packed. That's an example of one on a a pallet there. The only one that had been recorded um, is the one that we're now calling the ship stone. The Royal Commission does have a record of that one. Although the only records we really had of them were a set of 19th century drawings um, that's now in, in um, the Society of Antiquaries has um, in their collections. So the original plan was just going to be to photograph the stones and to give them complete records. Um, but, however, uh, speaking to, to Graham about digital scanning, I think it was about something completely different at the time, um, and from that we decided to apply for HLF funding and make it into a larger project. So the needs identified were to get the stones known, to get some research done on them, to create medieval learning material um, for the schools, because that's something that um, had been requested. To raise the profile of medieval Dundee in general, and then also to raise the profile of, of the steeple. So the opportunities provided by this project were to get people involved in heritage, to teach people new skills, undertake new research, learn about new technology, hopefully humanize history, to focus on some of the objects um, in storage in the museum, some of Sally's casts might be among those as well, um, and to create a template for future projects. So the funding was granted, and originally we were just going to take the stones out of storage, scan them there, and put them back in. Um, but fortunately, the project coincided with the renewed interest um, that the council has developed in getting um, the steeple back into use. So this gave us the opportunity to kind of reconnect with that building that might have been sort of part of the original complex of buildings that they were originally associated with. So now that the stones are there, that's where they're going to stay. They're not going to go back into storage. So just give a very brief um, and highly edited um, outline of the story of the steeple, just to give you an idea of what these stones have gone through um, and what a rare survival they actually are. And the story of the steeple could probably be subtitled one disaster after another. Um, it was traditionally founded in 1190 by David Earl of Huntingdon after a near disaster um, when he had a shipwreck at sea. Um, the building he founded was torched in 1303 by Edward I, the English king. Um, various other things happened in between, but the early 15th century, they'd begun to rebuild again. Um, but this proved a lengthy and costly um, exercise. It wasn't finished until 1480, and the square tower that we know today is the old steeple um, is about all that's left from that. In 1547, Dundee's captured by the English and the church burned down. Only the tower and the choir remained. 
In the middle of the 17th century, we have um, Dundee besieged again, this time by the infamous um, General Monk. And then finally, hopefully finally, <laughs> in 1841, there was another fire. Um, this time it was in the heating system, so we can't blame the English. Um, and only the tower and the nave survived that one. <laughs> um, and as some of you might have noticed uh, when well, you're trying to find the conference venue today, this it may appear as one building from the outside, but it's actually um, a complex of, of churches. Um, and it, I think it reached up to four um, in the 18th century. So the stones themselves, after surviving all that, um, the first record we have of one, one of them was discovered in 1838 during construction of a drain in the old East Church. So that, that's down the end there. Um, and also found at this time, according to a, a contemporary record, were silver pennies, a coffin, a breastplate, a short sword, and various other arms and armor, including a two-handed sword. And I quote, all these relics were picked up and carried away by parties who intended the operation of the drain. So drain watching obviously had its benefits in those days. Um, in 1842, after the fire, while they're excavating the foundation for the new church, that's when we know the ship stone was found. And um, various other stones seem to be discovered at this time. So we have eight altogether. Also described were stones with hunting horns, compasses, and squares, and the whereabouts of those are unknown. So what do we know about the stones? Um, they probably covered elite burials here in this church. Um, as close to the high altar as possible, which was dedicated to St. Mary and would have been down at that eastern end of the church. But there are also various other altars. Um, more than 40 altars are recorded in the 15th century. They may have been associated with the medieval guilds, which are the precursors to the, to the nine trades. We know the trades had altars to their patron saints and held meetings at the graves of their members. This would later transfer over into what would become the Hauf, which, as we know, is Scots for meeting place. But it starts to get crowded in here. Um, the prices for the layers go up, um, though you could get a space if you'd fallen in one of those many sieges, <laughs> apparently. Um, and actually, um, they're still, in 2011, when they're putting in this nice new floor right here um, to make this into a lovely co conference venue, uh, a few more of these people made themselves known. <laughs> and they're still under here, laid out in nice rows. So we know they must have had markers at some point. So if you think of the eastern end, we don't know the exact size of the footprint, but you consider the length of the church, um, how many stones there must have been originally. Um, so the wealthy paid for these layers as well as for the masses to be said for their souls and candles to be lit to ease their time in purgatory. Um, so going back to the project. And also, um, there were burials outside the church as well. During the um, expansion of the Overgate, Suat um, excavated burials of probably um, probably the artisan class, not the elite. Um, and you can read all about that in the Tafak Journal, Volume 6, which is on sale <laughs> through there. OK, so the stones were moved um, with a crane into storage, into the room out there. Um, and already, just as we were moving them, we were attracting a lot of attention and visitors and people who had never been into the museum um, were quite interested and quite curious about the stones and, and sort of came up with their own theories of what they might be. Um, so it was really interesting to engage even at that earliest stage with people. Um, so since the move, we have held a series of events. Um, on Doors Open Day last year, we had more than 400 people come to see the stones. Um, to, and to observe the scanning process by, by AOC. Um, we've also had a series of workshops and training sessions, which Graham will tell you a bit more about. And we're also having another open day tomorrow, um, and we'll have a stone carver out. Um, so that's another sort of step, um, learning about the process of how the, the stones are actually made. And the public are also um, able to choose, this is um, giving the public a choice in their own history, um, to choose their favorite stone to go on display in the McManus galleries. And they voted for this one, which has um, sort of little ladies' heads on it. And that one is currently now on display in McManus. There's also um, a gallery tour of highlighting four medieval objects in the McManus, which is, will be downloadable from the museum's website and also the project website. 
Um, there's a booklet downloadable from the website and a school's resource, which will be joining them shortly as well. So the website was created in the hopes that um, we could get people to contribute research to it. We really wanted it to be um, as public a project as possible. And the website has been a little slow, but bits we've received have been of quite good quality. Um, and the, the website will remain active for at least another five years, so we're still always looking for people to contribute it to it. So I think this is probably a perfect audience here. Um, and we're, we're looking for things even just as simple if, as if you'd seen another stone somewhere with a similar carving, or if you have any theories about what some of the carvings might mean. We don't expect academic essays or anything. Um, so what next for the project? Well, we're hoping to upgrade the display in the steeple. As you'll see, the, the stones are just laying out on wooden pallets at the moment. Um, give a lot more interpretation from all those wonderful things that people are going to contribute to the website. Um, and to, to upgrade, sort of up a bit the public involvement in the website. So um, please do get involved. And with these two, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Graham. I might have to skip through a few slides here to get back to where we were. Okay, so as Christina said, um, when we first started talking about the project, we, we really wanted a way that we could um, make the stones accessible as, as possible to as wide an audience as possible. And as she mentioned at that stage, it wasn't necessarily clear that we were going to be able to leave the stones on display. So we started talking about uh, digital uh, media and ways that we could make the, the stones accessible to, uh, to everyone to look at, um, uh, not just physically, but online and digitally. Um, so there was a, a sort of, as obviously the accessibility was one of the main aims, but also uh, there was a, an element of, of wanting to create a detailed and accurate record that could be the basis for, for future studies of the stones and stones like them as well. So. So we talked about laser scanning and, and, and getting this information online. So those of you who may have seen laser scanning before, it's an increasingly uh, widely used technology. Uh, the, the type of system that we were using here is slightly different to the, to the one that you would see uh, in some of the examples that Matt's uh, uh, Forestry Commission surveys show you here. Um, so we're looking at very, very high accuracy, high density scanning. Uh, at sub-millimeter sub level to produce these kind of these geometric um, geometric meshes uh, that you see on the on the right here. Uh, so collecting huge amounts of data and processing them in such a way as to provide these kind of um, artificially lit models that people can inspect online. So from the, the kind of millions of, da of data points that the scanner collects, the kind of terabytes of data that we have now sitting on our servers at, at AOC, uh, we can extract these kind of uh, almost virtual geometric meshes. And, and from these are tremendously useful things because they can be manipulated in certain ways to, to create artificial lighting and to enhance and, and display certain features of the stones. So uh, they don't project particularly well in these, because uh, they're quite dark slides, I'm afraid. But, um, but you'll see, if you, if you look at the website, which uh, I'll give you the address at the end, you'll be able to see that it's an excellent way of, of um, presenting and enhancing some of the features of the stones that aren't always even clear to see uh, with the naked eye in the flesh. So first and foremost, it's a, it's a good way of visualizing the stones, presenting them. Uh, and, and we're able to do things like to reconstruct the broken stones, like this is the, uh, stone number eight, so we can reassemble it back into one, one model and present that in one line, uh, in, uh, in, one, in one piece, rather. Uh, and uh, again, just producing these kind of rotating uh, models with the stones lying in positions that they would have been used uh, in real life provides just kind of a, a way of, of, of gaining an appreciation of the stones that isn't always necess uh, necessarily easy to do. Uh, in the flesh. But also from those we can extract more uh, kind of traditional uh, products, these uh, illustrations, these orthographic views of the stones, uh, the kind of things that we might expect to use in, in publications. Uh, so uh, there's an academic um, uh, value to, to the digital recording as well. So we have these kind of detailed records in a standard format that allow comparisons to be made with other stones as well. 
So moving to the website then, um, the, the principal aim was to get this, this information uh, onto the internet in a way that everyone can access it. Um, so we, we built this, this website just with a page for each stone, um, essentially giving a back, background to the stones, the background to the project, um, the information that we know about the stones, but really designed to provide a, a, a starting point for future studies, for public contributions. Uh, and each page has open, uh, has, uh, uh, has open comments that you can make and, and log your, your own information, as Christina said. So along with the, the information that's currently known about the stones, there's a little bit of description about each of the features of them, but also these interactive models. Oops, if we go back. These interactive models here, which allow you to click on the stones, rotate them, and change the lighting and the viewpoint to zoom into different features and, and things so that you can, you can look at the features of the, of the stones that interest you. And again, just to illustrate, one of the useful things about having all this information digitally is the ability to, to change the lighting source. So you can do that interactively on the web page. And for things like the inscriptions on the stones, uh, some of which are not easy to photograph or to display, uh, using traditional methods, it's quite, a, quite an effective technique for, um, for allowing users to, to change the lighting and look at the parts that interest them. As Christina said, uh, again, we, we condensed all that information down into a, a more kind of traditional booklet, which you can download as PDF, and there's a few printed copies around. So the information that we have about the stones, some of the, the output graphics all condensed down into, into um, uh, this booklet. So again, alongside the recording process, as we were doing it, we had open sessions and workshops and teaching people just, um, although we were using quite sophisticated and uh, sort of cutting edge scanning technology, also teaching people to understand what it is, the rationale behind the recording process and, and the kind of traditional methods of recording stones. So teaching people to look at the features, to try and understand what they are, and also how to, how to, um, how to record them graphically using simple uh, scaled drawing techniques. So, and as much as uh, the, the project was about using new technology to record the stones, there's also a rationale behind it about understanding and observation as well, which is something we were keen to get across. And again, alongside the, uh, the, the, um, the recording process, we did sessions with school groups and other uh, young people to get them just thinking about what they can see on these stones and how to draw them to scale. And we had little sessions with, uh, with uh, uh, young people where they could uh, draw their versions of the stones and, and uh, think about some of the symbols that were depicted there and what they might have meant to the people that, um, that lived at that time. And again, just associated kind of spin-off projects. We work, worked uh, a session with the, uh, a group concerned with the, um, the gravestones at the Hauf graveyard, which just around the corner, um, uh, wanting to, to produce um, uh, plans and detailed drawings of the, the carved stones there. Uh, so we were able to kind of just do training sessions about recording stones and producing their own records as kind of spin-off project. So what we think this, uh, this project has done then is really just to take a step towards a kind of new way of thinking about uh, presenting uh, objects like these carved stones for things that aren't necessarily practical to go on display in traditional ways. Um, but also this can be done not just as an exercise professionally, but as something that can be open and uh, open to participation and public contribution as well. And the result is not just, uh, not just um, the website, but as an archive and a starting point for, some, for future research as well. And, and we hope that it could be a model for, for similar projects. Thank you.